D&D number five, Angels, in Jesus' name. All right, let's start a new book, number five. I'm going to read you the fratter two. It begins with a special dedication. When the men and women in our armed forces, our police departments, and special agencies have integrity, when they are upright, honorable, and honest, they can do immeasurable good in this dark world. When they are not those things, they can do immeasurable harm. So for those of you who strive to be virtuous, who choose the light of Christ over the darkness, we remember that you do the hard jobs the ones no one else wants to do, even that no one else can do. You are true grit, highly skilled, and you and your families have our gratitude. Joshua 1, nine, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. All right, we're going to keep some tabs here and see how old everybody is when this book begins. When Angels begins, it is late August. In the Kino senior family, there is Eric Kino has turned 51. Shelly Kino will be 47 in October. Mark Adams will be 21 in October. Little Joseph Adams will turn 2 in June. Joey Adams just turned 9, just turned 19 on August 22nd, and Jeffy, June Flower, was 10 in March. The Kino Jr. family, Ricky Kino, turned 33 in May. Brianna Adams Kino just turned 30 August 27th. Eric Kino is one and a half. In the Lee families, Justin Lee is 48, Jason Lee is 39, his wife Angel is 37, and Kimberly Lee is was 8 in March. Agent Jefferson Davis is 25. In the Smith family, Toby Nash is 36. His wife, Caro, or Caroline, is 34. Grace Smith is 6. Brody Smith is 2. In the Stewart family, Chaz Stewart is 31. Lisa, Lisa, Lisa Lewis Stewart was 28, May 15th. Lena Stewart is one and will be two in November. And in the Apple family, John Apple is 32, Jody Apple is 30, and Jacob Apple was two this last February. Note to reader, dear reader, the book you're about to read contains the full spectrum from the beautiful warm fuzzies of life to the ugliest and darkest of evil. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Psalm 106, 37-38 But God has a plan to counter all of the evil around us, though it seems lately that evil has infiltrated everything, taking away things that we once thought good and pleasing. We can rest assured that it will not always be so. In the meantime, what can we do? We can become God's warriors. By fighting against the evils of this world in our own small ways, we can be the best we can be. We can spread goodness and kindness and love and compassion wherever we go. We can pray, for prayer warriors are extremely powerful. Hopefully, God will be able to pat us on the back one day and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I pray all who read this book be filled with God's light, to be healed in any way you are in need of healing, and that your faith and testimony will grow by leaps and bounds, and that God's powerful love will bloom in your hearts and minds. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name, I pray. Amen. And I always look forward to hearing from you, so you can contact me at McCartneyGreen at gmail.com or at EarthGirlSusan at gmail.com. And here's a quote by Mary Baker Eddy. When angels visit us, we do not hear the rustle of wings, nor feel the feathery touch of the breast of a dove, but we know their presence by the love they create in our hearts. Prologue. 
Hey, man, did you get any more pictures with this week's letter? The soldier asked as Bradley Anderson examined his mail. Blonde, blue-eyed Anderson held an envelope up with a smile. Yeah? She sent me individual pictures of each baby and wants me to guess which one it is before I turn it over and read the back. Lizzie's worried that I'm not going to be able to tell the twins apart next time I see them. He ain't talking about the babies, Anderson. He's talking about that fine wife of yours, another soldier quipped. Anderson held up the last picture with a sly grin. You mean this one of her in the bathtub? There was a frenzy as the men hurried to see the picture. It was jerked from his hand. As each man saw it, he groaned and passed it to the next and went back to his own bunk. Finally, Anderson had the picture back in his possession. Adoringly, he stared at the picture of his wife, fully clothed, in shorts and a t-shirt, standing in the bathtub with bubbles all around her as she bathed the twins and their oldest daughter all together. Her swollen belly huge, he could imagine the strain on her back, and he wished he could be there to ease her burden. Anderson glanced around at his buddies. It was his first tour of duty in Syria, and he was one of the youngest in his unit. Yet, he already had a beautiful wife and gorgeous kids, and he was a happy man. The military had been his deliverer. The kids had come along before he and Lizzie had been ready, but the military offered him the chance to support them and soon to get his education. Life was going to be so good. So how'd you rate such a looker, one of the men asked. How'd you meet her? He smiled. I met her in kindergarten. You're kidding. Nope, met her when I was five. We grew up together. So you never had anyone else? Look at her, man, another piped in. Well, I mean, look at his old pictures before he went home and knocked her up again. Would a man need to have anyone else? Yeah, she's hot, his buddy declared, sighing. Put them together and they look kind of like Barbie and Ken dolls, don't they? Both blondes, both blue-eyed, the all-American couple. I bet she was a homecoming queen and he was captain of the football team. When Anderson didn't respond, they all laughed. He's right, huh, Anderson? He shrugged good-naturedly. Guess you got me pegged. So who took the picture, Anderson? She sure ain't taken up with... Are you sure she ain't taken up with some other guy? Bradley grinned. There was nothing they could say to taint the love he and his wife shared. Nah. She's staying with her mom while I'm gone. It's a real blessing, her having someone to help her. I'm just glad... He never got the sentence out. The explosion jarred them to their bones. Soldiers scrambled from their quarters, headed toward the sound. Bradley Anderson was right in front, the horrific sound of men screaming, echoing in his ears. What was left of the car bomb burned harmlessly a few feet from their gate. Anderson arrived on scene and, without thought for himself, scooped up the soldiers sprawled at his feet. Only after he had the man on his shoulder did he realize shots were being fired, peppering the ground around him. He ran, noting as he did the others, wounded from the bomb that would surely die if someone didn't get them out of the line of fire. He made it to cover, dumped the soldier, and headed back. His fellow soldiers were returning fire, providing cover as he and one other ran for the wounded. Anderson scooped up the biggest guy, since Anderson himself was big and could take the weight. Even with his strength, though, Bradley struggled to make it back to cover. He'd been almost there when the sudden fiery pain slammed into his back. He pitched forward. Looking down, he was reminded of that movie where the alien jumps out of the guy's chest. Only this was no alien. It was his own heart. Lizzie, my girls, God, please help them. His last thought was that Lizzie may never get over this. He should have been more careful. Chapter 1 Lizzie Anderson <clears throat> was definitely the most beautiful woman in the town of Tyler Springs. Some folks thought probably in the entire state of Georgia, and sweet, Lord, Lizzie was sweet. She had both the heart and the face of an angel. She was young, only 24, and there was no reason in the world that Lizzie should not have a companion in her life. However, Lizzie knew, as did the entire town, that she would never marry never have another relationship, never even date another man. Not because men didn't find her attractive. Men wanted her. Teenage boys fantasized about her. However, everyone knew that Lizzie was a package deal, and that package included five miniature Lizzies. Five. 
five tiny angels, all with the same white blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and cherub faces of their mother. Two three-year-olds, two four-year-olds, and one five-year-old. Six gorgeous females living together in Lizzie's parents' old home out on Two Trees Drive in the thriving little town of Tyler Springs, 60 miles north of Atlanta as the crow flies. Lizzie didn't complain about her lack of male companionship. It was everyone else in town who speculated about her future. Most only shook their heads when they thought of her, which wasn't too often, mostly on Sundays when she marched the little ones into church. She'd made her bed, and now she had to lie in it, was the common phrase muttered as, as she passed. That and, oh, what she did to that poor boy's f future. Why, if not for her, he probably would have ended up being governor of the great state of Georgia. It had been close to four years now since Lizzie's husband had died a hero's death in Syria. Add to that the death of her father the year before, and then just recently Lizzie's mother's death of a stroke, and it would make a lesser person take the jump. Yet, Lizzie kept that beautiful smile on her face, held her chin high, and kept on keeping on. She had no choice. Five lies depended solely on her. There was no one else except God. In God, she put all her trust. Mommy, Heather cried. Rose won't get her head out of the refrigerator. Lizzie blew out a patient breath. I'm coming, she called sweetly. She turned back to Mrs. Hurley, one of her mother's oldest and dearest friends, as she finished gathering the basket of toys. So, Heather's homework is done, they've all been fed, and all that's needed is bath and bed. Mrs. Hurley waved Lizzie away. I know what has to be done. You just need to stop worrying. I've got everything under control. Lizzie smiled sweetly. Thanks so much. I don't know what I'd do without you. Now, I haven't had time to get to the dinner dishes, but don't you worry about them. I'll get them when I get home. Mrs. Hurley frowned like she would leave dishes in the sink overnight. Before the older woman could chastise her, Lizzie turned and rushed into the kitchen to pull her daughter out of the refrigerator. Rose, what are you doing? I want my sucker, Rose cried. I told you, no putting half-eaten suckers in the refrigerator. It's been thrown away. Rose burst into tears. Lizzie scooped her up. Oh, now, baby, tomorrow you'll get to have another one. Shh, now. Mommy has to get to the hospital, and Mrs. Hurley is waiting to give you all a bath and read to you. I don't want you to leave, Violet began to cry. Lizzie knelt down to hug her other four-year-old, Rose, and Violet. <clears throat> Lizzie knelt down to hug her other four-year-old. Rose and Violet were the most vocal about their objections to their mommy going to work at the hospital way down in Atlanta. She only went four nights a week, but they were long nights considering the commute. There was a small yet decent hospital right here in Tyler Springs, but it was fully staffed. It was always fully staffed. Then there was the convalescent home up off the highway. Although the pay there was so low, Lizzie might as well be working at the local McDonald's, which she had actually considered. She hoped somehow to change her situation soon. Dr. Duncan at the hospital and his very kind wife of 20 years had taken her under their wing and informed her that they were putting their heads together to help Lizzie find a better situation, like maybe have her take in a boarder or develop some sort of home-based business. For now, though, nursing was all Lizzie knew, and as Dr. Duncan said, she was a darn good one. Come on now, Violet, Lizzie comforted. Mommy will be home before you even wake up in the morning. You promise? Yes, I do. Now give me a kiss and be good for Mrs. Hurley. Gathering Rose and Violet in her arms, she kissed them goodbye. Next, she stood and kissed three-year-olds Daisy and Lily, who were still in their booster seats at the dinner table, delightfully smacking their spoons in their applesauce and watching it splatter. Oh, girls, stop making a mess, Lizzie muttered. Don't worry, Lizzie, I'll take care of it, Mrs. Hurley said with a chuckle. Sighing deeply, Lizzie finally turned to Heather, her eldest, at five, who'd become pensive and quiet since the death of her grandmother. Mommy, you'll drive real careful, won't you? Oh, yes, baby. Nothing's going to happen to me. But sometimes bad things happen and people go away to be with God, and we just have to accept it. Isn't that what you said? Just like Nana and Granddaddy and Daddy? Lizzie blinked back the tears that threatened. Yes, baby, I did. But I promise, sweetheart, I will be oh so careful. 
and come back to you. Okay? Heather nodded her head, but Lizzie could see the fear still there in her eyes. Living in fear is going to destroy her child, Lizzie thought. She had to do something. She had to make something work. She had written to Bradley's parents again, hoping that they'd have a change of heart, but she'd received no answer. She hadn't really expected one. From the moment Lizzie had announced her first pregnancy, they'd turned their backs on her and Bradley. They were angry with her that she'd seduced their son away from doing all the things he dreamed of doing. Because of her, he put off going to college. Because of her, he joined the military. And because of her, he was dead. She couldn't really blame them. It was true. If Bradley hadn't known her, hadn't loved her, if she'd been more mature and less innocent in the ways of sex, if she hadn't told him she'd been pregnant and just let him leave for college, he'd be alive. No, she couldn't blame them at all. Thanking Mrs. Hurley again, she jumped in the minivan and pulled away, glancing in the rearview mirror. Little Heather stood at the screen door, staring after her. New scene. I've been made, Special Agent Keegan Tanner said, his tone fierce as he flew around the next curve. What did you do, his superior officer, Nigel Court, demanded. I didn't do anything. It doesn't make any sense. There's no way, man, no way they could have known. What are you saying, Keegan? You know exactly what I'm saying. Someone tipped them off, and it came from the inside. There was silence on the other end. Then finally, any ideas who? There was no safe answer. No way was Keegan going to start throwing out names. He'd been betrayed before by his own commanding officer. He kept that thought to himself. No. Where are you? I'm headed south, maybe an hour or so from Atlanta. Get to the field office. You have the evidence? Alarms went off in Keegan's head. Something was not right. He did have the evidence. An amazing amount of evidence, but something told him to hold off, letting anyone know. He didn't know if it was instinct or paranoia, and he didn't care. Tanner, do you or do you not have the evidence? Not on me, he lied, but I will have it soon. What do you mean, not on you? Where is it? It's safe. I have to get to it. I took some precautions in case anything happened to me. King could hear Nigel's impatient breath. Was his S.O. merely being assiduous, or was the note of anxiousness in his words due to another whole scenario, one that had to do with working with the enemy? When you do recover the evidence, Agent Tanner, what do we have? Telling the extent of what he had could prove to keep him safe, so he went for it. Oh, I have everything. I've got bank records of all accounts, payoffs, and amounts. I've got phone conversations, including hit orders. I've got names and addresses of hundreds of the placed kids. And I've got Senator Hartman linked to it all. Nigel was silent for a moment and then finally, good man, Tanner. But that doesn't include the most important information, which is, I'd rather not say over the phone. I'll get to you soon enough. We have time. We'll have to move very carefully. Believe me when I say this is a really big deal. I suppose I'll have to trust you on that. That's right, sir. You will. So where's the evidence? Keegan frowned. Someone had blown his cover. He didn't really think it was his superior officer, but there was something in court's tone that warned Keegan off. Not that they had ever been best buddies. Their working relationship had always been strained, and Keegan wondered now if that was because his sixth sense warned him. Tanner, where is the evidence? It's safe, he finally said. Safe where, Tanner? He patted his breast pocket. Safe. I'll get to it. I'm on my way now. He checked his rearview mirror again. He'd stayed off the interstate, taking state highways instead. He'd gotten out the moment he realized he'd been compromised and didn't think he had a tail but he wouldn't fall into complacency. Nigel cursed. Keegan, I'm your superior officer, and I need to know where the evidence is that's going to break this case wide open. Need I remind you how long and hard we've worked on this? Keegan's eyes narrowed. No, you don't have to remind me, since I'm the one who's been standing in a veritable fishbowl surrounded by a bunch of sharks. Those same sharks have gone from swimming quietly around to a feeding frenzy, and my name is at the top of their menu. So no, 
You don't have to remind me of a thing. Then tell me, what did you do with the evidence? It's safe. Chill, Nigel. You'll get your evidence. And it will be in front of witnesses, he thought. He patted his breast pocket again. Everything depended on him getting the computer chips and tapes to the Atlanta field office in one piece. Everything. And many innocent lives. He couldn't fail. Nigel sighed heavily into the phone. Just get the evidence and get to the office. They're expecting you, and be careful. As careful as ever, he said, pressing the accelerator. I just have... The buck appeared out of thin air. In the split second before he hit it, Keegan took in the huge rack, the arrogant tilt of its snout. He jerked the wheel too late. The impact resembled that of a crash test as the hood of the brand new Ford Mustang crumpled. Only in a crash test, the car doesn't go airborne, and the brick wall doesn't spring away without a care in the world. One last big difference. He was no unbreakable, bloodless dummy. New scene. Find him, Senator Hartman said calmly as he patted the fine linen napkin to his lips and placed it neatly by his plate. We'll find him. He'll head to Atlanta. Well, let me remind you that we're speaking of $5 million per child. $5 million. That's $25 million that had better not slip through my fingers. We can't take the chance that he knows about that rendezvous. I said we'll get him. As far as the five kids, I doubt he knows. Only a handful are working on that operation. And I don't see a way he could have found any information on those kids. There's no record of anything having to do with this exchange. Well, we can't take a chance. There's too much at stake, and once the exchange is made, you and I will be the only ones to know. Any others will be terminated. Yeah, so you've said many times. I get it. It's not like I'm sentimental. So then, what do you think this guy has? The senator asked wearily. I don't know that he has anything. He had, however, been invited into my home. It's possible he snooped through my records. I know he bugged my phone, which is how he knew he'd been tagged. That's why he was able to get away before we were able to take him out. He bugged your phones? Then it is possible that he heard a discussion or two about our plans. He shouldn't have been able to get away. He got away by killing two of my men residing at the hillside property, apparently without a sound, as the three others who were there swore. He hid the bodies and took off. He was gone before the others had any idea what was going down. Sloppy work. Take care of that. It's already done. Listen, Senator, don't worry. Agent Tanner is not more than a few hours ahead of us. The Senator sighed. You idiot. A few hours may as well be a week. And if the guy had your phone tapped, then it's extremely possible he's overheard something about the big exchange. So you just find him. You make sure he didn't get anything that links me to the operation. Find out who he's been in contact with, then kill him and them. No exceptions. That would be my pleasure. New scene. Pain. It clouded his brain. It surrounded him like a thick fog. He'd never imagined he could feel so much pain. Moisture ran from the corners of his eyes, down the sides of his face, and into his ears, and he realized he was crying. For the first time in his life, he felt like praying. If he could just get out from under the car, maybe the pain would ease up. He raised his head, trying to see just what kind of predicament he was in, but just that tiny movement caused waves of nausea to roil through him and shot pain through his body so intense it was enough to make him cry out. Easing his head back down, he peered up at the beautiful, bright blue sky. He heard the birds singing and thought somehow it was all wrong. Don't they know how he feels? They should be silent, out of respect, or at least sound a little less cheerful. Okay, calm down, he ordered himself. Just calm down. He knew better than to panic. Someone will find me soon, and they'll call an ambulance, and they'll give me something for the pain, and I will be eternally, eternally grateful for that. It may take them a little while to get the car off me, he thought, but that won't be hard. That weight won't be hard, knowing that relief is coming. Relief. Oh, dear God. The pain. He could hear cars going by on the road. Not a lot of traffic, but a car every few minutes. Turning his head slightly, he tried to judge just how far off the road he was. 
20, maybe 30 feet, down an embankment, maybe more. He couldn't see the road from his vantage point. His heart sped up. If he couldn't see the road, then no one on the road could see him. Stretching out his neck, he tried to prove himself wrong, causing unbearable pain to shoot through his back, his legs, his head. He stilled again as panic began to build. What if no one comes? I could lie here for days before I finally die. How much could he take, he wondered, before he'd actually start praying for his own death. Slowly, his panic subsided and his logical, rational brain came back to him. He was an FBI agent. He'd been heading to Atlanta with a pocket full of evidence that would put ruthless criminals, including a United States senator, behind bars. Even more important, he had information of an exchange to take place that was one of the sickest plans he'd ever heard, and he thought he'd heard it all. Without him, the bad guys would complete their plans. He'd been on the phone to his SO, who was desperate to get his hands on the evidence. Court would come searching for him. The thing to do right now is to put his mind to staying alive. He had to live in order to complete his mission. Pinned down the way he was, all he could do was hope that he'd be found by the right people. Otherwise, he was dead meat for sure. Squeezing his eyes shut, he tried to focus on the mission. He had to protect the evidence. Yet how? What could he do to protect what he'd worked so hard the past two years to get? The evidence he held would put an end to a vile organization that dealt in child trafficking. Glancing down at his hand, he realized he still clutched his cell phone. Slowly, he moved his hand up in front of his face to look at the phone, his heart sinking as he determined he only held part of a broken phone. His eyes closed with the pain moving his arm had caused as he thought of the evidence so vulnerable in his breast pocket. If the bad guys arrived before anyone else, they would be able to retrieve it and destroy it, not to mention destroy him. Still, he didn't really think that would happen. They had no idea which direction he'd headed. They'll assume it was toward Atlanta, and they'd be right. Only they won't think he'd taken out of the way state highway. No, he wasn't too worried about the bad guys finding him. It's the good guys he worried about right now, because there is a traitor among them, and a wolf in sheep's clothing is the most dangerous. What could he do? He struggled to pull himself out from under the car again, grunting with the effort and pain stabbing through him, sharp, throbbing waves pulsing through his body. Eyes rolling back in his head, he saw the stars that precede passing out, and he stilled, knowing he couldn't allow himself to lose consciousness. His hands fell to his sides in defeat. His fingers dug into the soft ground in frustration. And then he came up with a solution. The ground was soft and moist from the most recent rain shower. It was definitely soft enough to make a small hole. Gripping the broken cell phone, he dug it into the ground by his side, scooping out the dirt the best he could. His breath became labored almost immediately as the pain shot through his body. His eyes watered, a body's natural response to pain. Cry, he thought. Cry all you want, but get the stuff buried. Working until he could reach his entire hand and half of his forearm down into the hole, he sucked in a breath and blew it out softly. Sweat ran into his eyes, stinging them. Without thinking, he raised his shoulder to wipe the sweat, but stopped when the searing pain knifed through him again. His head fell back in anguish as he breathed, waiting for the pain to subside willing it to subside. Slowly, he moved his hand inside the breast pocket of his jacket, groaning with the agony. Straining the tips of his fingers, touched the plastic bag, and he drew it into his grasp. Breathing heavy, he held the bag up in front of his face, checked the seal, making sure it was closed against all moisture. I got you, he muttered. Without further ado, he pushed the bag into the hole and covered it with the dirt. Then for several minutes he patted the ground until no one could tell it was freshly turned earth. Now, he thought, I just have to find out where the heck I am so I can find this place again. Twisting his head as much as he could, he took note of every tree, bush, plant, and telephone pole. Everything he could see he arranged on a mental map until exhaustion finally overcame him and he closed his eyes and slept.
When Keegan opened his eyes again, he was staring into the night sky, and the pain that engulfed him was coming in waves. It felt as if someone was rocking the car, and then he realized it wasn't the car moving, it was him. His muscles and his legs and back were cramping, spasming, sending thunderbolts of pain and anguish riveting through him. He cried out. In a desperate panic to stop the torture, he placed his hands against the car and pushed but his effort produced nothing except more pain. Moaning, his head fell back in defeat. It was then he noticed lights flashing against a night sky. And someone yelled, Hey, I think I found him. Keegan tensed, hoping it wasn't someone on the way to put a bullet between his eyes. A flashlight skimmed over his face, and then someone was hurrying down the hill, dirt and rocks being dislocated in his wake. A guy about Keegan's age knelt down beside him, he wore a dark blue shirt that bore a fireman's insignia on the pocket. Keegan breathed a sigh of relief. Hey, buddy, hold on now. He smiled and placed his hand on Keegan's shoulder. I'm Jim, and we're going to get you out of here real soon. Jim, Keegan breathed. It is really good to meet you. The paramedic turned, studying the car and how it bore down on his patient. The car was on its side. The man pinned securely under the driver's side door. He shook his head, then rose to speak to the others who were ambling down the hill. We can't move the car until we have him stabilized. Otherwise, it'll kill him. Keegan couldn't hear what they were saying, but he could read their facial expressions. It didn't look good. Finally, his new best buddy turned back and knelt down beside him, offering a comforting smile. He began asking questions about what Keegan could feel or not feel. Keegan supposed he should be thankful that he could feel every single excruciating inch of his body. Once they'd assessed his condition, he waited patiently for the relief he'd counted on. They started an IV, monitored his heart and blood pressure, which he heard them say is extremely low. Men were rigging the car, getting ready to lift it off him. Jim knelt beside him again. He in some pretty good pain? Keegan drew a steadying breath. Yeah, he grunted. Pretty good, man. Okay, we're going to get you something. Hold on. He waited the few minutes it took for another paramedic to come down the hill with the good stuff. Gratefully, Keegan watched as his new best friend administered the medicine through the IV. Okay, he thought. Any time now. Just a few seconds to relief. Then he felt his body relax as the narcotic hit his system. Jim smiled at him and patted his shoulder. Better? Drugs are not disappointing in any way. Jim chuckled. So I've been told. Okay, now hold on. We're getting ready to get you out of here. Keegan nodded. He heard the revving of a motor, the moving of chains. He saw the men scuffling around for position to protect him. Felt a slight relief of pressure. And then the car moved. He screamed just before the world went black. New scene. He moved through the dark corridors, the gray swirling mist curling around him as he progressed. Tired, sluggish, his body needed to rest, but he was forced to move toward the door. Part of him dreaded what lay beyond, and part of him craved it. The door opened without him having to touch it. Then, as always, he was made to lie down on the bed. He never remembered actually moving toward the bed and setting his weary body down upon it. Suddenly, he was just there, prone and vulnerable. That's when she came to him, the angel. He could sense her nearby. He could smell her. She came to him each day, or was it night? He wasn't allowed to know which it was. He couldn't open his eyes, so it was always dark. He existed in a limbo of sorts. That was part of his sentence. She had power over his will. She would not allow him to speak. He tried, but her power kept the words from coming out. He was not allowed to move. Again, by only her will, she kept him still, though he struggled with all his might. He was unsure if she came to offer relief or possibly to punish, for she did both. Her soft, gentle hands moved over his body each night. He preferred to think of it as night when she came to him. He preferred to think of her as a gentle seductress who snuck into his room as he slept. Each time she came to him, she began the same way, moving her warm hands over his head and face, stroking him, caressing him, running her fingers through his hair. 
Her touch was so caring, so gentle, that sometimes it brought tears to his eyes. He could feel her love, her kindness, her goodness. Truly, she was an angel. Slowly, her hands moved over his shoulders and chest, comforting and soothing. He could feel his heart accelerate, hear his breath become labored as she gently seduced him. The sound of his own breath, inhaling and exhaling, echoed in his brain. Surely she could see what she did to him. Surely she knew the torture of her touch. But she didn't stop, and she didn't hurry, and she never hurried. Her arms locked around him. She pulled him to her, cradling his head against her. She held him there, her hands caressing his neck and back. It seemed her mission was to touch each part of his body, and she never failed. No part was left untouched. She knew him intimately. He assumed he died in the accident, and floating in this dark world was his eternal punishment. He'd lied, he'd seduced women, he'd killed, and he'd failed his last mission. Of course he should be punished, and now he must endure this exquisite torture. A cruel joke God played on him to send him an angel who brought him so close, then left him to suffer, his body pulsing in agony. Gently, she eased his head back down, but her hands never stopped. Moving lower now, they stroked the muscles of his stomach, making them quiver. His heart pounded. He wanted to raise his head and watch as she moved her hands over him, but her will was iron, and he was not allowed this boon. Long, even strokes moved over his thighs and legs, his feet. She was so warm, so smooth, so paced. She never hurried, though he just noticed there was a small difference this night. She was singing. Yes, he could swear he heard her sing. Her voice was as angelic as he'd imagined, sweet and dreamlike, ethereal. Another difference, she seemed to be taking longer this night, going extra slow, taking extra care and extra time, prolonging the punishment. Oh, she was a cruel angel, cruel and thorough. His heart slammed against his ribs. Such sweet torture. Please, sweet angel, don't leave me tonight, he begged silently. Just another moment or two. He held his breath, but his breathing returned to normal as he tumbled down into a deep, peaceful sleep. New scene. All I know is that is one gorgeous man, Pam said. I wouldn't mind having a little alone time with him. Good Lord, Lizzie declared. The things you say, Pam. What are y'all talking about, Rhonda asked as she came back from taking pain meds to one of her patients. Pam giggled. The new guy. Rhonda grinned. Oh, the stud in 302? That's the one, Michael Moreland. Oh, give me a break, Lizzie said. You don't think he's good looking, Rhonda asked. I mean, my goodness, he's like six and a half feet of solid muscle. He could be in one of those calendars. Tell me you see it, Liz. Of course I do. Mr. Moreland is nice looking in a dark, dangerous sort of way, but she stopped. Pam turned to look at her. But what? He's not your type? She finished for her. Why? Because he's not blonde and blue eyed like Bradley was. Liz, I love you like a sis, but you know what I'm going to say. You have to move on. It's not that he's not my type. I was just going to say that I'm not interested in him other than to cure him. It doesn't matter how good looking he is. You certainly don't expect me to hit on a patient. The poor man has enough to deal with. Dr. Duncan approached the nurse's station. Hello, ladies. Doctor, Pam said as she grabbed a chart and began writing. Dr. Duncan, Lizzie said with a smile, you're here awfully late. He nodded. Sometimes it can't be helped. I realize you're just coming on, Liz, but I need to see you a moment. Oh, yes, of course. She walked with the older man down the corridor toward a sitting area. He'd served in Vietnam, and he'd been her mentor, taking her under his wing while Bradley had been away in the service. He looked like an older version of Denzel Washington, and his wife, Ermeal, was one of the kindest people Lizzie had ever known. When Bradley had been killed, and later, when Lizzie's mother died, the Duncans had been her survival. They led her through the maze as she'd taken care of arrangements for funerals and filled out endless paperwork for veterans' benefits. After her mother's death, Lizzie had cried on Ermeel's shoulder, literally, for days. Ermeel had stayed at the house with her. It was two weeks before Ermeel finally felt Lizzie was strong enough to function, and when Ermeel left, she knew the difficulties Lizzie faced and promised that somehow they would come up with solutions. 
Lizzie was grateful for her care and kindness, for she admitted, if only to herself, that she was alone and a little bit afraid. I believe I have a temporary solution for you. Her eyes darted up to Dr. Duncan's face. You do? Well, since your goal, and mine, and Ermeal's, I might add, is for you to stay at home with all those babies, and since what you get from the VA isn't enough, you'll remember we discussed you possibly taking in a boarder. Yes, we discussed it. It just so happens I know of a patient who needs a nurse and a place to stay while he recovers. Her eyes glowed with excitement. You do? Oh, that's wonderful. What do you know about him? Is he elderly? What sort of special needs does he have? Because you know I'm not really equipped for anything right now. Okay, calm down. It's all going to be taken care of. Actually, the patient is someone right here on this floor. He needs a place to stay while he recuperates, and he needs someone to take care of him until he's able to take care of himself. He's a patient here? It's Mr. Moreland. Michael Moreland? Yes, he's out of danger now. As you know, we've kept him sedated since he tried to jerk out his IV, but we're done with that since we may be transporting him as early as tomorrow or next day tops. Keep a close eye on him tonight. Anyway, his brother has asked to have him move someplace private, and he's willing to pay well for his care. How well? Her eyes opened wide when Dr. Duncan, when Dr. Duncan named the amount. However, there is a stipulation, Dr. Duncan continued. What's that? Mr. Moreland is a celebrity of sorts, a writer. Apparently his publisher will drop him if they hear of his accident. But why? That doesn't make any sense. They'll drop him if they believe he won't be able to produce by his deadline. And so his brother has asked that no one know about the accident and no one know where he's being taken, which is the reason for the need of a private facility. She shrugged. Well, I don't think that would be a problem. I can keep a secret. He was pretty adamant about it. He asked that you not tell anyone, not even your friends here at the hospital. All paperwork is going to be sealed. Wow. I guess money is power, huh? It's the way of the world, I'm afraid. Listen, Lizzie, if you're not comfortable with this, we can wait for another opportunity. I just thought this would be a perfect way for you to make the jump to running your own facility. With what they're willing to pay and to provide all special needs equipment, it will set you up perfectly for future patients. No, I'm not uncomfortable at all, she said quickly. So this is completely confidential? She nodded. Absolutely. So how long will his recovery take, in your opinion? Eight to ten weeks, but you'll be paid in advance for three months. That long? I'm sure you'll realize he'll be up and about after a few weeks, first in a wheelchair and then on crutches. He lives alone in Denver, and his brother says that they could transport him there and hire someone to come and stay with him to take care of him in Denver. But his brother lives here in Georgia, and he wants to make sure that Mr. Moreland is well taken care of. Once he's out of the cast and has a few weeks of physical therapy behind him, he will be assessed. He could go home after that, even though he'll need to keep up with his physical therapy. Even then, he may still walk with a limp and be in need of a cane. And when this is all over, what then? Well, you're always welcome to come back here anytime. You know that. Still, if this goes well, I'm thinking we can send, your pati send you patients on a continuing basis. There are always new stroke patients and elderly patients who would love a setup in someone's home rather than an institution. And with your certification and we rush a state license, I think you just may be in business. She smiled up at him, tears in her eyes. What can I say to you, Dr. Duncan? This is almost too good to be true. He smiled at her. You are usually the one who has something to say about stuff like this. Don't disappoint me now. Her eyes twinkled. I say, God is so good, so amazing. He's gone far beyond answering my prayers, and I am so grateful. His timing is always perfect, and I will be on my knees thanking him. But I also need to thank you and our meal for your prayers and for your willingness to help God bring about his plan. You are angels among us. He laughed. I wouldn't go that far. Well, for Ermeal, yes. For me, not so much. He glanced at her watch. Well, speaking of Mr. Moreland, I'd better make my rounds. He doesn't know yet that he's being moved. His brother wants to be the one to tell him. She nodded. 
Okay, well, I'll speak to you soon. We have to make arrangements for a bed and other equipment to be shipped to your home, but don't worry. The family will pay for all expenses. Now, don't forget, not a word, not even to the other nurses or doctors. She reached for Dr. Duncan's hand. Thank you, Marion, she said softly. You don't know what this means to me. He smiled and patted her hand. Oh, I think I do. And I for sure know what it means to my wife. Lizzie hurried away, a smile spreading over her face. This is perfect, she thought. Finally, I won't have to spend half my paycheck paying for child care. And more importantly, I won't have to leave Heather in tears every night. She went about checking on her patients, anxious to see the one she'd soon have in her home. When she came to Michael Moreland's room, she quietly pushed open the door. He appeared to be sleeping. Smiling, she went about her duties, checking the IV, then the blood pressure readout. She made notes on a computer and turned to take his temp, and his eyes were open. Oh, well, hello, she said softly. He swallowed. You're real, he answered, his voice low and gravelly. Quickly, she poured a small amount of water and held a straw to his lips. Yes, of course I'm real, she said. Here, just a little. We don't want to have you sick. It had been a stupid thing to say, he realized. He nodded and sipped the water. It was cool and soothing. Thank you. You're welcome. Keegan watched her as she set the cup down and turned back to him. Long, straight, blonde hair swept up in a ponytail, blue eyes that sparkled with kindness, a heart-shaped face and sweet smile. His eyes roamed downward over her body. It was hard to tell with her scrubs on, but she appeared taut and athletic. She cleared her throat and his eyes snapped back to hers. Can I get you anything? He licked his lips. Her voice was soft and sweet. Was this his dream girl? Was this his angel? He shook his head, realizing he needed to get his bearings. He forced his mind to attend to business. How about some information, he asked. Okay. Do you know my condition? She smiled. Well, luckily, you're alive and in one piece, she said cheerfully. When he didn't smile, she went on. That was some accident. Actually, that area on Highway 54 has seen several bad ones. You know that your car flipped and you were pinned underneath for several hours? He nodded. I remember the accident. I hit a deer, a giant devil deer with big antlers and evil red eyes. He watched her as she laughed, her eyes dancing. An angel. He brought himself back to the conversation and shrugged boyishly. That's how it seemed to me anyway, the deer from hell. He seemed quite pleased with himself. Did you say Highway 54? That's what I was told. He was silent a minute while he digested the information. He'd been on Highway 78. And my official condition? You've moved from critical to serious to stable to good in the space of about a week. You broke your leg in two places. It was a pretty bad break. You were in surgery for several hours. You also pulled some muscles in your back. <clears throat> but thankfully, your spine was not damaged. You bruised your liver and cracked three ribs. It's the bump on your head that we've been watching closely. Reaching up, she touched the side of his head softly. He closed his eyes and sniffed the air. It was her. He opened them again and cleared his mind. How long did you say I've been here? Let's see, Mr. Moreland, she said as she lifted the tablet to peer at his chart. You were in ICU the first 24 hours, and you've been on this floor going on six days now. What did you call me? Mr. Moreland? Michael Moreland, is there a problem? She asked, wondering if there was some amnesia. His heart sped up. Problem? Uh, no. Has anyone been here to see me? I've been told that your brother was here. My brother? He didn't have a brother. Yes, I work the night shift, so I haven't seen him, but Dr. Duncan told me tonight that your brother was here and has arranged for your care. His jaw clenched. Obviously, his identity had been changed. Either that or he's in the twilight zone. He was suddenly struck with an acute case of claustrophobia. He had to get out of here. Is my wallet here? Well, I'm sure it's here somewhere, she said, opening the drawer. Here it is. She went to hand it to him, but realized his arms were in restraints. It appeared he realized it at the same time, and he jerked his arms. What the hell? 
He looked up. What's going on? I'm sorry, Mr. Moreland. That first day when you woke, you went a little crazy and they had to restrain you. They decided it would be a good thing to let you remain that way until they were sure you were in your right mind. He jerked his arms again, becoming agitated. Calm down. I'll undo them, she said softly, moving her fingers over the straps and releasing him. There now. It's okay. She spoke soothingly, and the sound of her voice steadied him. Drawing a deep breath, Keegan forced himself to calm. My wallet, he said brusquely. She handed it to him, and he opened it and found his driver's license and stared at his own picture and then read the name and address. Michael Moreland, 350 Bolden Drive, Denver, Colorado. His thumb skimmed over various credit cards with the same name. He pulled out a few business cards and found one that read Nigel Court. Bad credit? No credit. Everyone rides. His S.O. had a sense of humor. A small one. Pushing the card back into place, he made note of a few hundred dollars and twenties, then handed the wallet back to her. Everything still there, she asked, seemingly amused. Yes, he answered grumpily. Raising a thermal sensor, she pointed at his forehead. Let me just take your temp and I'll leave you to get some rest. As she pulled away, he grabbed her wet wrist. Have you been here every night? She looked down at his hand, surprisingly strong for a man who'd been hovering on the brink of death just a few days ago. No, I was here for the first three nights, then I was off the last two. And you're back tonight? Obviously. She glanced down at his hand and raised her eyebrows. He let her go. Sorry. I'm just a little disoriented. She smiled at him. It's okay. I understand. Who wouldn't be a little discombobulated after what you've been through? Sighing, he ran his hands through his hair. I've got to get out of here. She frowned. That's what you were saying when they had to restrain you. Envisioning the situation, he looked up with a slight smile. I gave them a fit, huh? He asked, humor playing in his eyes. Lizzie was mesmerized. The slight turn of his mouth at the corners, the dimple in his left cheek, the lock of dark hair that fell over one side of his forehead. Jeez. She returned the smile. I wasn't here, but they told me you went a little crazy and tried to pull out your IV, tried to lower your leg from traction, kept saying you had to leave. I must have been delirious from pain. She smiled again, and he felt he might float to the ceiling. Are you in pain now? Not too much. Actually, I'm hungry. Well, that's a good sign. I'll get you some juice and crackers. She turned to leave. Wait, don't go yet. Moving back toward the bed, she took his hand and squeezed it. It's okay, Mr. Moreland. I'll be back soon. But I do have other patients I need to attend to. Be good and don't try to get up or pull out your IV, okay? He nodded. She smiled and left. How could he be so stupid? He sounded like a little kid. Wait, don't leave. But man, she was great to look at. He needed to stop thinking about the good-looking nurse, though, and figure out how he was going to get out of here and get the evidence into the hands that needed to hold it. And then he needed to stop the bad guys from going through with their horrific plans. Glancing at the useless leg dangling in front of him, suspended in the air like some marionette's appendage, he cursed. He was a sitting duck. It was late the next afternoon, and he'd been dozing. The abrupt knock on the door jerked him awake and had his body tensing. The door swung open, and Nigel Court strode into the room. Keegan's eyes narrowed. Nigel? Mike? They were silent as each other as each took the other's measure. I guess it's you I have to thank for finding me, Keegan said. Nigel shrugged. No need for thanks. Couldn't lose a seasoned agent. I'm just doing my job. I used your cell phone to pinpoint your location. Which was? Highway 78, an hour or so north of Atlanta. And I'm now Michael Moreland, whose accident occurred on Highway 54. That's right. And you're my brother? Yeah, different fathers. My license says Denver. I don't know anything about Denver. I guess you'd better get online and do your damn homework. Keegan's brow furrowed. Nigel was usually extremely composed, businesslike, a machine.
It wasn't like him to curse, which meant he was unusually stressed, and that was probably because he wanted to get his hands on the evidence. All kinds of scenarios ran through Keegan's mind involving Nigel and the bad guys working together. He shook his head to clear it. Yeah, I'd like to do my homework. One more reason why I have to get out of here. Everything's been arranged. We're transporting you tonight. To a safe house? To somewhere safe. Keegan blew out of breath. So where's the evidence, Agent Tanner? It's safe. As soon as I'm able to be up and about, I'll recover it. I'll follow procedure and turn it into the field office. Well, tell me where it is, and we'll take care of it for you. You can just worry about getting well. Keegan swallowed hard. I wish I could, but it's not that easy. I'm the only one that can recover it because I'm the only one that can find it. There's no way I can even tell you. Nigel paced the room, his temper on edge. It wasn't on you. It wasn't at the scene of the accident. No, as I said, I didn't have it on me, but I also said it's safe. We need to move on it. We have time. Nigel blew out a frustrated breath. Listen, Tanner, I got people breathing down my neck too, but I'm going to give you some leeway since it appears paranoia has you in its grasp. Let me just tell you this. You'd better figure out real fast who you can and can't trust. I've worked too hard and too long on this investigation to let it go now. You mess this up and you'll go down. Keegan nodded. I understand. You'll have your evidence. Nigel stepped back and looked out the door and turned back. I'd better take off. Hold it. Eyebrows raised. Nigel gestured impatiently. What happened to Keegan Tanner? Nigel's lips pressed into a thin line. His eyes hardened. Special Agent Keegan Tanner died in a car accident. His body was burned beyond recognition. He felt inside his jacket for the newspaper page he'd folded and placed there. Bringing out the page, he tossed it onto Keegan's chest. His memorial service was held yesterday in Knoxville, Tennessee. He survived by his mother, father, and two sisters. Dear Jesus. Jesus ain't got nothing to do with it. It had to be done, not just to protect you in this investigation, but to protect your family. My father has a heart condition. Well, he's still alive, so he made it through the service. You son of a... Look, Tanner... I didn't mean any disrespect. You know they would have gone after them. They would have killed your parents, raped and murdered your sisters, if they thought in any way that you were alive. They would have used them any way they could get to you or to make them talk. Even if your family had talked and told all they knew, they still would have died. This way, they're safe. It had to be done. Keegan nodded reluctantly. He let His head lifted. Did you have men at the funeral? Of course. Your fellow agents would have come to mourn your death. And did any of Hartman's people attend? We think so. Well, they're not going to be satisfied without seeing a body. Oh, there's a body. It's just not yours. You're kidding. Hopefully it will take them time to figure out it's not you. Keegan's brow furled as he thought, so I'm dead. They should be expecting a raid based on the evidence I was able to provide. That raid won't occur, at least not for a while, which should make them think that I didn't make it back with the evidence or that I didn't get away from there with any. That should tell lull, lull them into a little bit of complacency. In the meantime, in the meantime, we move Michael Moreland someplace safe and give him time to recuperate. Then we get the evidence and we make our move. Keegan nodded. They are going down. And that is the end of chapter one.